Welcome everybody to the Handheld Book Club. We are going to be talking tonight about Women's Weird as edited by Melissa Edmondson. Melissa, could you wave to the camera, please? Mm -hmm. Here we are. And Amy Sturgis. <clears throat> Amy Sturgis, who is a renowned Gothic scholar, she will be interviewing and discussing with Melissa and throwing questions at her. Amy, could you wave your hand, please? Mm -hmm. Good to see you. Um, so, Amy, I'm going to throw it over to you now. Could you please start the talking and we'll see how we get on. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, before I begin, could I just, if you have already read Women's Weird and you have your webcam on, could you just give a wave so I can get a sense of how many? OK, several people. Fantastic. So I have questions for you, Melissa. I'm very excited about this and I want to talk about some specific stories and authors you've included in this anthology. But to get started, I have two broad questions to kick off this event. And the first one, uh, which is probably most relevant for those who haven't yet encountered uh, Women's Weird, and you should, is in your introduction, you talk about the fact that uh, there have been many efforts to explain the weird to delineate some kind of weird canon, sort of a list of must read works and authors. And that a lot of these efforts have intentionally or unintentionally defined away women's contributions uh, to the weird tradition. And I wondered if you could just start by talking a bit about what we gain in our understanding of the weird by restoring these voices to the conversation. Um, what we learn not only about women writers, but also about the weird tradition itself and what it is and what it means by recovering these voices and, and reading these almost lost or at least forgotten works. Or to put it more succinctly, why women's weird? Um, I think that's, you know, a great question. And it's really how sort of how the project got started was with a question that Kate posed um, to me, um, where are the women, you know, where are the women who wrote these stories. And I think that there's sort of different maybe answers for that question. And I think one of the sort of you know, areas that I wanted to sort of focus on was maybe what's called, um, you know, the the older weird or the more traditional weird. I know there's the term new weird. Um, so I wanted to sort of go back in time a little bit and really focus on works in the 1890s. So, you know, you'll see the, you know, the 1890 to 1940. So I wanted to sort of, you know, go back and, you know, look at, yes, 50 years and sort of see that tradition develop in women's weird fiction. But I think also putting it back into the 1890s, the 19th century, to really see how women were writing in the weird tradition you know, before a lot of the male writers that we think of, you know, with, you know, Lovecraft and, you know, Mockin and Blackwood, and I, I could go on. Um, so I wanted to sort of establish that tradition quite early. Um, and then I think, you know, another thing that we get, which it's sort of an, an interesting kind of fine line to tread is we get more of, and I do hesitate to use this term, but the domestic in women's fiction. And the reason I say it's sort of a fine line to tread is because so often uh, that term has been used against women's writing or to sort of, you know, restrict it or even, you know, should I say belittle it, um, you know, in supernatural fiction and gothic fiction, in weird fiction, um, and those, you know, things are very interchangeable as well. Um, but I wanted to sort of spotlight not all stories by any means that so we'll you know, talk about some individual ones, but a lot of the stories in the collection, you know, do focus on the domestic and the sort of weird things, you know, that happen, the unexplainable things that happen within the domestic space. But I've always said that, and I think this is a unique feature of women's, you know, supernatural, weird, gothic writing, that you know, we think of the home as the safest place, right? Or supposed to be the safest place. Mm -hmm. And when it turns out to not be the safe place, when it turns to be a place of danger, I think genuine feelings of fear and dread, you know, come from that. 
So, you know, you know, I definitely wanted to take that tradition back into the 19th century, but also, you know, put it in sort of the domestic. Um, so I think those were some of the things that I wanted to look at. And like I said, also include stories that, you know, we could say, for instance, and I know we haven't gotten quite into, you know, specific ones yet, but if we look at something like, you know, Mary Chomley's story, um, you know, we could say, oh, um, you know, let loose. That could be something that people might say after they read it. That's very Jamesian um, or that's, you know, that's, but um, that story was written in 1890 before you know mr james was writing his story so that complicates the narrative in a lot of ways or something like francis stevens i wanted to include that to give a sort of a counterpoint to maybe a lovecraftian narrative so it's a long answer but i think there's a lot of things that were sort of going into you know the thinking behind um you know what these stories can add to our understanding of the weird you already anticipated my next question uh, a bit, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, how did this go from a question, where, where are the women, uh, to, to the final product? How did you decide which authors, which works? Uh, that seems like a, a, a really overwhelming task. Um, how did you, you know, plot out exactly uh, uh, how this would come to fruition as this, this anthology? Yeah, this is something Kate might want to chime in here as well, because my response to that question was to send her a very long list of, and, and pretty pr relatively quickly after she sent the email, I was like, here's a list of 20 plus women who wrote in this tradition. So after that, it was really, it was sort of a neat process because I would send Kate stories and she would, you know, like some, she, and there's some that she didn't really care for. So we sort of went back and forth and um, it was interesting because for every story she said, nope, don't like that one. I said, here's another one. And, you know, we just kept going, <laughs> we kept going on and on. It was like a, a tennis match or something. Um, so, you know, but I think we wanted to, again spotlight you know different authors and I think there's a nice mix in there as well of authors who are um, I, I hoped you know were fairly well known like Edith Wharton um, you know there were definitely some um, hopefully you know other people like Charlotte Perkins Gilman I'm trying to think of some others that are in the contents there that um, you know were maybe a little bit more well known or like in the case of Wharton, she might not be as recognizable as a short fiction or supernatural fiction writer because she's a novelist, right? So we wanted to have that nice mix, but then we wanted to have, you know, some genuine discoveries. And I think there's, there's several of those in there as well, you know, whether it's Marjorie Lawrence or Eleanor Morden, uh, we really hope that these would be, you know, quote unquote, new names to a lot of people. So we wanted to have that mix in there. Yeah, it was a very interesting process because as we read the stories together, we, we, we found our criteria coming through. So the stories had to be really, really good, absolutely top quality for literary purposes. They had to be fantastic to read and they had to be weird with a capital W. We wanted tentacles and we got tentacles, I think, and we wanted strange creatures and we wanted unseen terror. We wanted all the the hallmarks of weird that we couldn't really put our fingers on, but we get, oh yes, it's here, this, this one here. But at the same time, I was very aware this is a book I have to sell. So when Edith Wharton emerged and E. Nesbitt emerged, I was going, yes, these are sellable names. These are names that university libraries will want to stock. And these are names that the casual reader will recognize. And this will help as an entry point to the unknown writers who were trying to present to the world for the first time. So there was a, a quite pragmatic commercial impulse as well in how we chose the stories. And some stories, even when we went on to volume two, a year and a half later, Melissa was still trying to sell me on this wretched story about a black cat and I hate it and she loves it and I'm never going to publish it, but she wouldn't stop trying because we have different ideas about what's a good weird story and that's fine. Yeah. yeah, everyone has their own unique, I think that's what makes it so interesting. Everyone has their own unique 
you know, definition of the weird and, you know, stories, it's interesting, you know, you, you might not like a story and I love a story and it, you know, you think multiply that, you know, times all these readers and everyone's having different reactions, mm -hmm. you know, to these stories. And it's a great conversation, you know, that develops then with between, between people. Yeah. One of the reasons I was excited to be invited to do this was because I get to talk about the stories here um, that, that uh, I was most uh, carried away by. I, I will say one of the things that impressed me so much was the depth and breadth of this. If, if one story doesn't work for you, just wait, because the next one is something completely different. And, uh, and that speaks a lot to what you're bringing back to this tradition by restoring these stories. But uh, I'd, I'd like to to shift gears, if I may, then, and, and ask you about some specific works. Uh, the one that that I still think about on a on a rather constant basis <laughs> is um, is the book from 1935 by Margaret Irwin. Uh, what a story! And uh, you point out in the introduction that the great Joanna Russ. Any anyone who's taken one of my science fiction classes knows who giant Joanna Russ is. Um, wrote in How to Suppress Women's Writing in 1983 that this story is one of the most interesting stories of the supernatural I have ever read, which is high praise from Russ, uh, for who, knew, who knew supernatural stories. There's so many chilling aspects to this story, the book, some of which I don't want to give away. Uh, but one of the ideas that stuck in my head from the story is the idea of this, this bookcase, this bookshelf, sort of poisoning the reading experience. First, turning the children off of, uh, of reading altogether, and then sort of hurting the, uh, the main character to this one book so that his other reading experiences, you know, he picks up a murder mystery and he immediately knows who done it. And he reads classic, uh, comfort reads for him, uh, authors that he knows he can go to like Dickens or Bronte, and suddenly he sees these terrible things underneath the stories he can't believe he never saw before, but they're all um, really uh, uncomfortable experiences for him, cruelty or, or self-pity or other contemptible traits, and until only the book is left and that book has designs on him and is going to manipulate him and use him. It's such a, a malevolent sense of stripping away, you know, intellectual comfort and safety until uh, uh, this ultimate uh, manipulation can happen, turning a character against his life, his, his, his dog, his child, his, you know, in the service of his career. And I, I wondered if you would talk a bit about Irwin, who you point out is out of print, which is kind of, you know, her other works are, are not available, which is, is mind boggling for a story like this. Um, and and if, if we can do a sort of broad general spoiler, what it means for a story like this, that there's a redemptive ending, but not a happy ending for uh, a, a male character like this. Yeah, I think one of the things that really sticks out to me about that story, and I would say that probably of all the stories in this volume, that's probably the one maybe that's the most recognizable. Um, and even if you don't know a lot about Irwin, which I maybe doubt a lot of people do know a lot about her, they've probably seen the book somewhere. But it was, it, I think it's one of the, you know, the best weird stories written, you know, by a, a, a woman, by a man. And I really, I tried to make an argument to Kate about, you know, yes, this has been anthologized, but, you know, we need to include it because I think it's one of the best examples. But one of the things that always fascinates me about that story with um, this, this man Corbett, who's the sort of the main character, like you say, who's, who's influenced by this book, um, I, I'm, I'm always left wondering how much of his sort of gradual, you know, breakdown is the book? How much of it is him? And I think that Erwin, again, she's she's ambiguous enough that we don't ever really know and again that brings out the weird the sense of unease we can't put our finger on it and I just I love that story because again we don't know we get hints that he's unhappy with his life mm -hmm. and I think 
again, it's, it's, you know, this, this male character who's at the center, but we get such a backstory about him. And I think, again, that's sort of a hallmark of women's writing is they're, they're really good at giving us backstories for these characters, that he's doing these terrible things or thinking these terrible things, but we're sort of right in with him. And, you know, we're, we're scared for him. And, you know, I think that that's, you know, again, that's sort of left at the end of the story too. You know, how much of this is going to maybe come back you know you get rid of the book but how much of this you know lingering unease is going to come back or this, this unhappiness this unfulfillment you know that he has with his job and maybe his family um so i think there's just a lot going on with that story and um yeah um margaret Irwin's really interesting she um she wrote a lot of historical novels and did not write a lot of supernatural weird gothic fiction um, and she's one of those examples where Another one I would say is D.K. Broster is another really good example, wrote lots of historical novels, and we just wish that they would write more, you know, having read these stories, I just wish they would have written more supernatural fiction, um, but there's only, um, I think Kate and I were talking about this, I think we only managed to find about maybe seven to eight Irwin mm -hmm. stories, and some of those were a little bit kind of even pushing the boundaries of is this supernatural? Yeah. Um, so and the thing yeah. about Irwin and her yeah. Irwin's novel, still she wished for company. It's what would have been now called a YA novel. It's about a teenage girl who time slips. That's really good, and I was pursuing that. But the problem with Margaret Irwin is that she's bloody expensive. Mm. Her agents and her estate ask a very high amount of money for permission mm. to publish. And we didn't, I mean, we had to discard some stories because they too would have been expensive, but we needed Irwin. So that's the problem. That's, Amy, that's the reason why Irwin is not much in print because she's expensive. And, you know. Yeah, Still She Wished for Company is one of my favorite. If you ever Amazing. find like a second hand, I mean, and they're, they're fairly rare, but if you ever find one, it's, an, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful novel as well. Yeah. I think um, they're yeah. coming out with someone else, but because mm. I was in discussions, but I don't know. I don't yeah. know. But yeah. But that's an it's an interesting, I mean, maybe it's not as interesting, but I think it's an interesting practical point about what you said about, you know, a lot of these, what would we say maybe maybe a third were still in copyright, mm -hmm. Kate, that we had. Yeah. And it, it did come down, you know, to this is getting very expensive. And, you know, I I will, you know, say I know this this um, you know, is focused on the first volume, but I really wanted to include Marjorie Bowen. And, mm -hmm. you know, again, one of the big names in supernatural weird fiction. And it just, it got to the point where I had to say, I think people probably know about Marjorie Bowen. So as much as I'd like to include a story by her, I'm going to have to let her go. And so, I'm so thankful that we did a second volume because she was my first, I was like, you know, she's going in number one because I, I really hated to leave her out. But yeah, I mean, unfortunately, and I, you know, I understand their issues about, you know, estates and I, we wanted to respect that as well. Um, so, but yeah, that, that was another decision that sort of going back to your earlier question that did sort of shape um, mm -hmm. our decisions about putting the stories together. Another favorite of mine that's going directly into the classroom for me is, um, is The Hodge. By, uh, by Eleanor Mordant from 1921. I would classify this as a science fiction story, um, but of course it's doing a lot of other things as well uh, with this, this prehistoric man being, being reawakened in what would be modern times for the story um, by this brother and sister who bring him back as a pet, as a friend, as an it, right? He's never, he's never really accepted as, as a sentient being or as an equal. Um, but the, the most fascinating part of it to me is that while the story is in part just questioning what it means to be human, it seems like there's this undercurrent questioning what masculinity is or what it means to be male. And there's a tension there with the sister Rhoda um, being in the center of uh, a, a kind of conflict between uh, the brother and, and 
Hodge, this, this prehistoric man. There's a passage in here that just, if, if I may, if I may just share a quote or two. Um, uh, and yet she, the sister Rhoda, um, was puzzled, all on edge, as she had never been before. The look Hodge had cast at her brother was unmistakable. But why? Why? What had changed him? She never even thought of that passion common to man and beast, interwoven with all desire, hatred, the lees of love, jealousy. Uh, all that evening, Hector scarcely spoke. He was not so much scared as gravely anxious in a man's way. And then later, later on, uh, Hector is thinking, and he says um, or to himself, uh, something like a uh, red hot iron burnt up in the back of his own neck, his head throbbed. After all, what did death matter when life was so rotten, so inexplicable? It wasn't that only, only, well, it was beastly to feel so tired, so altogether gone to pieces. This is almost as much about the brother as it is about this prehistoric man. And I wondered if, if you could talk about the importance of this story and about, about bringing that story back and also about Eleanor Mordant. And I do believe you're working on a, on a project bringing more of her work to us. Uh, could you talk about this just a bit, please? Sure. Um, I would have to say that um, Eleanor Morton was probably you know, for me, and I've been doing this for, for quite a while now, you know, looking into women and women writers in the supernatural, uh, she was sort of a, 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 an amazing discovery for me. And um, I managed again to track down um, an out of print, um, she, her work is out of copyright, but also very much out of print. And um, I found a, a collection of her stories and I read through them. And that was another example. Um, I should say that this happened quite often as well, where I would send Kate, you know, I found this, this amazing author and I can't choose. Here's the top three stories. And I just cannot choose the, the you know, best. And, and we would kind of go back and forth and finally decide which one, you know, we wanted to include. But that one was really interesting because like you say, Amy, there, there are, there's these science, science fiction elements to it. Um, you know, there's parts that maybe are horror, um, you know, there's supernatural, there's, there's, so, there's weird, that sense of dread and unease where, and I think I, I might say this in the introduction that he's sort of, you know, he's not out of place, but he's out of time. And, you know, this, this idea of him being an it, and, and like you said, that's, that's really interesting, all this, this masculine, you know, angst and, you know, he's, he's just a teenager and he's, he's, like you said, trying to be put in this, this, this position and not to give her anything away, but what you said makes me think about, um, no spoilers, but the, the last act is such a sort of traditionally masculine, but he's uncomfortable, you know, with that as well. Um, but yeah, um, Morton was amazing. She, um, again, wrote over probably 50 or so, um, short stories, probably more. And she is one who did write, I would say specialized in supernatural um, fiction. Um, she is just at her best. And um, yeah, you're, you are correct that we are, we are, maybe Kate wants to talk a little bit about that as well, but uh, we are bringing out um, that sort of our next step as we have a few collections in the works dedicated to single authors that were first spotlighted in these two volumes of Women's Weird. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, she, she was a world traveler. Um, she was a very fierce, independent woman, like so many of these, these women writers are. Um, but yeah, she's just, her writing too, there's just like this haunting, but it's, it's like this beauty that comes out too in her just I'm so glad you read a, a portion of her story because her writing itself is just we have this you know horrific story but her writing is so beautiful and the way she describes things um so yeah Kate did you want to say anything else about uh, we've, we've been talking recently because um we're working <laughs> on the proofs of Morden so so oh, we've been yeah. talking again about how, how wonderful she is well yeah the, we're, we're going to republish nine stories um, one of which will be Hodge. We have to do Hodge again because it's an important story in her, you know, her collection. Um, two of the stories are really quite long. They're more like novellas, which is why the book is only nine, but it's going to be a big fat book. It's, we have to 
yeah, I'm already slightly worried about the word count and I'm writing the notes at the moment, just the historical notes at the end. Yeah, it's going to be marvellous. This is one we crowdfunded. No, we didn't. We crowdsourced the cover for. So we picked out lots and lots of images we wanted to do for the cover. And I did a shout out on Twitter saying anybody wants to help with the crowd choosing. So we had about 15 people giving their opinions on what cover we, we should choose. And in the end, the cover was the one that Melissa liked best and everybody else liked best. And I personally don't. I think it's really not right, but that's fine. We're going to go what the public want. And the sales reps love it. You know, the, the, the book trade likes it. I've just, I, my taste has failed on that one. But the contents are terrific. Really, really important. It's going to be a stonkingly good book. That's coming out in September, 14th September. And can be pre-ordered now on our website. Fantastic. Well, I will not mind reading Hodge again when I go through and read that particular one. And, and you, as editor, you can just make your own cover. You can just paste whatever artwork you want to on the front of your book. And everyone else can have something different if you want. That's, there you go. Um, very, very much looking forward to that. Uh, the author I was perhaps most familiar with, uh, I'm still really excited to see this particular uh, story um, highlighted in this book. That's Francis Stevens with, um, with Unseen and Feared from 1919. And one of the things I, I think is, is worth sort of underscoring is, is although you clearly are going back as you've already pointed out, Melissa, to, to look at sort of foundational works that aren't just contributing to the weird tradition but are helping to make the weird tradition from, from the get-go. Um, and, and so these are, are, are older works that are, are speaking to a particular moment in time. And yet some of these works feel so immediate and so relevant today. Um, there's a, a real um, staying power in the themes and, and the, the ideas here. And in Unseen and Feared, you basically got uh, Stevens saying that racism and hatred is a kind of infection, a kind of sickness. And uh, as, as you pointed out, using these works also as kind of a a pushback against some traditional narratives of what the weird did. Uh, if you take authors like a Lovecraft and say, well, they, they were just uh, products of their time. And here are some women writers who are products of their time too. And they're, they're uh, showing a very different perspective um, in terms of social issues and awareness and uh, a, a point of view that seems very forward thinking to us today and very relevant. Um, and if I may, once again, just read a little passage here. This is just such a great story. Um, I, I thought two of the cruel, sensuous faces I had seen in the streets outside, seen for the first time as if a veil had been withdrawn from eyes hitherto blinded by self-delusion, fatuously trustful as a month-old puppy. I had lived in a grim, evil world where goodness is a word and crude selfishness, the only actuality. And after she thinks about the, the people on the street and the, the hatred she's seen and, and what that hatred means at the end, she leaves us, uh, uh, or leaves the, in this section at least, a really powerful message. She says, uh, let um, one thing I could do, if one only, I could abolish my monster creating self. I just wondered if you'd like to talk a bit about this story and about Francis Stevens and also about the, the idea that stories like this are actually empowering readers. There's, a, there's an action that can be taken in a way, yes, yes, there's darkness and there's evil out here and we have to live through these things and experience them, even as you pointed out at home, right in the safest place we should be. And yet there's also a way that we can not contribute to that perhaps. Yeah, I mean, that's so interesting. I, I mean, what in the, the sections that you were reading, it does seem so relevant, you know, today. And that's a story that to me feels like you said, it feels very modern. It almost, it, it's almost mind boggling that that was that was 1919, you know, and it just seems like I can't believe that that was written in 1919. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's an interesting, and that's that's one that Kate and I had a little bit of a discussion about as well. Um, I think you were not sold on that story as much. And, and that's one I really, I pleaded with. I said, please give this a second read. And then I wrote this super long email, like defense of the story. And um, I just, I just, I felt strongly for including this one. And there are some, I would say, you know, there's some uncomfortable bits in there, but I think that she sort of, you know, again, that those racist elements are sort of redeemed because of the fact that he does sort of acknowledge the monstrous in himself and he says you know I am capable of having these feelings and I need to confront that and I need to own it and and I think that's a very strong you know element of that story and, and once again it's not you know and again I'm I don't want to make big generalizations but I feel like women writers tend to make their characters a little bit more inward where they do sort of recognize the monstrous within themselves. And, you know, it's not so much the male character having to fight against, you know, the, the tentacled monster, right? Or the supernatural threat and triumphing over, right? By the end of the story, we have, you know, the triumph over that, that, you know supernatural or weird element or whatever it is but you know with so many of these stories you've mentioned they end they're not necessarily happy ending that they're still making us question you know they're really they're really thought provoking and I, I like those types of endings they're not neat and tied up in a bow um, and I think that's one of those stories that really you know does that it makes you it pulls you in um, you know, that's what the, the power of all literature does is it pulls you in and makes you question, you know, your own beliefs and views and things and look, you know, holds the mirror up, right? And we see ourselves um, and in some unpleasant, you know, parts of ourselves as well, so. Do we have time to talk about one more story before? before oh, oh, excellent, good, good. Um, I'm just enjoying this immensely. Thanks. Thank you for your for your uh, for your answers. The uh, story that uh, when I was going through and reading this for the very first time, I sort of laughed at the the explanation, and I was I was set up, you know, uh, to to be persuaded. Um, the haunted saucepan, 1926, Marjorie Lawrence. Who knew that an inanimate object uh, could be sort of so creepy and infused with the evil of this femme fatale who really embodied some of the worst uh, traits, one might argue, of, of a person, um, a woman in particular, perhaps. Uh, could you talk a bit about how the, the ghost story, how the, I know you've already mentioned this word domestic, and it's a, it's a sticky kind of word to use in this this uh, context, but um, how how the the elements of women's writing and the weird come together in such a unique way. Um, there, there's a line in there where the the narrator says, "This finished me. Uh, I, I'm out of here." <laughs> you know, it it's a really spooky story, and it's quite amazing that it, it becomes such an effective. Uh, idea of history repeating itself through this malevolence. Um, what were you thinking about with this particular story in, 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 uh, in, in detail? Because I, I'm very intrigued by it and I thought it was a great addition to this, this anthology. Yeah, Marjorie Lawrence, um, you know, is one of my favorite writers. Um, so I knew uh, she was also one of the first on my list to say we have to get a story by her in there. And she was another author where I had a wealth of choices that I could have, you know, chosen. She's, she's you know, done several, um, you know, short story collections based on the supernatural. That was her specialty um, and also some um, supernatural novels. Um, she was a uh, lifelong believer in spiritualism, attended seances. Um, so just a really, really interesting woman. Um, but I knew I wanted to include a story by her. And some of the things that you said, I thought, let me go with the haunted saucepan because it's, it's such a unique story. I don't know of any other story like it. And, you know, Lawrence was a master of writing these types of stories. And I think you go into that story, or at least I do, and, uh, you know, you're thinking, this is going to be funny, 
you know, this is going to be a comic story. You can't, how can you make this? It's a haunted saucepan, you know, yeah, right, you know, ha ha. And she catches you off guard because you're right in there, right with the, you know, the narrator. And, you know, there's this kind of banter, right, going back and forth. And, you know, he's talking about the super low rent, you know, on the flat. And, you know, he brings his friend in and all this stuff. And, you know, they have the butler in there who's slightly comical. Um, but then it's like a, just like a, a switch, you know, flips. And right. that, I think that first description of the, I even love this word chortle, right, of the, the pan and the sounds that it makes. And you're right, you know, this, I mean, is there another like symbol of domesticity, you know, the, the kitchen and then the saucepan in the kitchen. And she turns it into this threatening, uh, malevolent, you know, presence that actually, not to give too much away, but does do harm, physical harm to the characters um, and instills fear in these characters. And, you know, to take something like that, that maybe in any other hands would just be a, a joke, you know, a funny story. She really makes an interesting comment. And like you said, it's a femme fatale. Um, and I love that story because I didn't I didn't want to include really too many traditional ghost stories. You mentioned the ghost story as well. And, you know, at the end, the woman is alive. You know, she's not a ghost. You know, she is, she is alive somewhere else. Um, you know, so I think, again, that's just this nice twist on that story. Is she somehow, you know, willing the saucepan to still be there in her space, in her luxury apartment, and still, you know, do all this damage. So again, the, how how Lawrence is working with conventions and traditions is just really, really interesting in that story. I agree, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, as I'm bringing this this part to a close, then um, can I just ask you uh, what's what's next? And in particular, um, now that we have two uh, uh, women's weird, how women's weird two relates. Uh, to, to the original Women's Weird. I know the authors represented in Women's Weird too uh, certainly come from a, a variety of places, uh, the United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and uh, is, is just as effective uh, as, as the first in terms of bringing back voices um, that need to be a part of our understanding of the weird tradition. Um, would you like to put that in context with the original volume or the other works that are coming out uh, soon, what you're working on? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, Women's Weird 2, you know, we, again, we, Kate and I were thinking about, okay, let's, let's make a complimentary volume, but let's also try to go in some new directions. And there's definitely room, you know, to do that. So, um, you know, I wanted to spotlight, you know, again, not just British and North American authors or, you know, U.S. authors, because um, we do have um, Canadian in there as well. Um, but, you know, I wanted to spotlight different regions and, you know, in some stories really spotlight colonial issues as well, whether it's, you know, Bithia Mary Croker and, and other stories in that, not, not to get too involved in the individual stories. So we wanted to take that approach and then just like with the first volume, we also wanted to, you know, have some authors in there who, you know, like Ellen Montgomery or Stella Gibbons, maybe surprised readers that, wait a minute, she wrote, you know, these, these weird stories. Um, you know, you think Anne of Green Gables, and she's also writing, um, you know, The House Party at Smoky Island, which I will say is probably, you could argue, yes, a traditional ghost story, but if you've read that story, the moment that the, the ghost is discovered, and I'm not really giving anything away, is one of the best written. It is, it is chilling how yes. she describes that. So I'll just say that. So, um, but yeah, Stella Gibbons is another. So we wanted to have that mix. Um, we wanted to have, um, you know, different voices coming through. Uh, we wanted to have, again, some undiscovered um, again, quote unquote, new authors come through. So um, I would say for the volume two, sort of the, the discovery for me uh, was Helen Simpson. Um, so we actually are going to do a collection of Helen Simpson's work. Um, so that's, that's coming up too. Um, and then we also have a DK Broster collection 
in the works. So, and one really nice thing I found about doing these, um, these individual author studies is we can show the variety. So within these volumes now, we do have some great traditional, you know, ghost supernatural stories. We have weird stories. Um, Broster has some just amazing horror stories. There's some, there's some amazing stuff coming up. So within those collections, we can spotlight the range of individual women, uh, which I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to doing. So, yeah. Wonderful. Great stuff. That's good. Right. Thank you both. I'm going to flip back to regular view so I can see everybody. Hello. And now is the time for questions. If you have a question you want to ask Melissa or even Amy, wave your hand or put it in the chat and let's see how we get on. Have we got anyone with a question straight off the bat? Or I'll let you think about it for a wee minute. Okay, I will ask a question while you're considering your options. Melissa, um, one thing that hasn't come up in the, the sort of the background environment of the stories is the, the, um, the Fellowship of the Golden Dawn, you know, the occult movement in early 20th century Britain that W.B. Yeats was an adherent to, and so was Alistair Crowley. This doesn't come up in the weird fiction we've been working on for the last few years, um, whereas it does come up in detective fiction of the period, because Agatha Christie and, and Marjorie Allingham, no, Naya Marsh, they both featured occults and, and um, yeah, occult movements and, and cults with women at the centre worshipping a, a male leader who is a synonym for the devil. Why do you think the weird that we've been looking at doesn't seem to want to go in that direction? Well, that's interesting because Mary Butts was a, a good friend of Aleister Crowley, and I believe that she was involved, was she not? So she was, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm throwing the question back at you, but I mean, I know that, um, you know, we included with and without buttons, which of course doesn't have anything to do with that. Um, an amazing story too. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering if, um, you know, it would maybe, I don't know if it would come out in her, I don't think it's in, it's not in Mappa Mundi, is it? Oh, there's no, no, yeah. but there's no sense of a, a, a movement. All the stories are about individuals pitted against other individuals alive or undead, but we don't get a sense of a group of individuals who are experiencing weird events or in part of a weird narrative en masse. And um, yeah, it's only really just occurred to me this evening when I was thinking through the, the stories that these are stories about single people or occasionally a person with their friend or their supporting sidekick, but you don't get the big groups. Um, whereas there is a Marjorie Allingham. No, it's not, it is Nio Marsh. It's a Nio Marsh story, which is a bit later, but it's 30s, which is about a cult in the south of France in which someone dies and it's all a bit dreadful and a lot of young boys kidnapped. And Agatha Christie as well, she does a couple of, um, I'm sure she has a couple of stories which have the cult as a background to the plot. Mm -hmm. anyway, I haven't read it as recently, but does Eleanor Scott, I'm thinking like Randall's Round, which is definitely one of the reasons I, I didn't want to include that is yeah. because it's, it's folk horror. And mm -hmm. I mean, I could have, but I wanted to include, I wanted to include um, the 12 apostles because I thought that was an interesting take on, you know, again, the M.R. James tradition. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I'm thinking that and, um, oh, the Marjorie Lawrence story, whose name um, is, I'm blanking on. But um, anyway, there's, there's sort of a, there's a group that kind of comes under the influence of Pan slash you know other mm. other minor gods and so there are a couple of examples maybe of community yeah um, yeah in some of those stories yeah but i can't think like you said i can't think of uh, right off the top of my head i can't think of a lot of examples it is very individual yeah um mm -hmm. the randall's round we, we also republished in british weird which mm -hmm. is a collection we did with james machin um and he was straight in there he wanted randall's round but yes good we get that one too Okay, well, it's it's a point to pursue for the ac active academics out, out there. Why aren't there group weird experiences? Why are they only individuals? Come on then, people. Are there any questions? What would you like to ask Melissa? Or Amy? 
good. Here we have Cleo. Cleo, a tendency, you mentioned a tendency of women writers for unhappy endings. Why do you believe that is? Melissa, what do you think? Because that's real life, isn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry to be bleak, but um, yeah, I think that's, you know, we talk about the supernatural, but that's also, that's also real. And I think that's one of the things that I keep coming back to. And, you know, if I do, you know, academic writing or, you know, choosing stories, the ones that really stick out to me are the ones that, you know, try to somehow reflect real life within, you know, the supernatural. Um, and, you know, I think again, uh, Amy, something I said earlier, and I think maybe it connects nicely to this question, um, you know, it leaves us thinking at the end. If we, we've got a happy ending for the moment, we're very happy and we're content, but we forget, you know, that's nice and we move on. But the stories that leave us feeling, you know, very much uneasy about things or throw us off guard, um, I just, I think those are really effective endings and they make us think about, you know, whether it's something within the story, whether it's a social issue. Um, and I, I, women tend to, I've written about this, but they tend to, um, to do these types of endings. And I think it's very brave, um, you know, when you're writing a story to, to end it. Um, and it's not open-ended, I would say, in a way that's um, unfulfilling, right? Or, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely there for a reason. Um, so I, I think, you know, that's one of the things I really like about, I like those types of endings. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So Amara has just written, Melissa, I'd be interested in your thoughts on women's writing as a career. In your research on these authors, are there any commonalities about their experience as writers that you can share? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that comes up is, um, and I mean, one of the things that comes up to me is, is the art of the short story and, you know, how these women and, you know, again, our attention is usually drawn to, to novels in a lot of ways, but, you know, how women really focused on the short story and really excelled at it. Um, and then you have a lot of, I think other commonalities too are, you know, the fact that they were novelists in a lot of respects. A lot of these, you know, authors that are included were novelists, maybe did not write about the supernatural, at, you know, if at all in their novels. And, you know, they, I, you know, could get into the reception of short stories at that time. And it, you know, was tended not, publishers thought it didn't sell as well. So they, they often tried to steer authors away from short fiction collections um, in favor of novels. So, um, you know, that's another similarity is you see a lot of these women writing very popular historical fiction, sometimes, you know, romance fiction um, that didn't have any supernatural elements to it. And they saved that supernatural element for, for their short fiction, which I think is interesting too. Mm. It could also have been the, um, the fact that short fiction, supernatural short fiction was very lucrative. You could earn a lot of money in the 20s and 30s publishing your short fiction in the, in the magazines, the story magazines, and then republishing it in a collection. So you would money more than once over on one piece of very short fiction that would only take maybe a couple of weeks, three weeks to write. Mm -hmm. So you got a better return for your investment of time and effort. Yeah. Because it's magazine, yeah, publishing in magazines is another, yeah, that's another example too of, you know, a lot of these women writers made, you know, had pretty good careers, paying careers, you know, publishing in magazines and then, you know, republishing. And it, it's, it's sometimes frustrating because, you know, you're trying to track down these stories and you know that there are probably other stories out there that weren't collected, but they were in magazines. And, you know, it's just like, oh, I wish I could, you know, it's sort of like Margaret Irwin. I would just love to be able to find another supernatural story. And maybe there's one out there, you know, we just have to keep looking for them. Mm -hmm. Question from Brenda. Are there any other writers that you would have liked to have included in either volume? What was on your wish list then, Melissa? Um, Whittington's cat. <laughs> <laughs> the one I really don't think is any good. No. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say probably one at the top of my list. Yeah, Kate's not going to like this, but Eleanor Smith, I, I love her story. I love her collection, Satan's Circus. 
Um, I've tried a couple of times to get, get Kate interested and um, I did the, I, for uh, volume two, I sent you Whittington's Cat again. And I also sent you um, the Waxwork story and you didn't like how this, that was an interesting conversation because you didn't like how women were treated in that story. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I could, I could very well see your point there that that's, it was a good, weird, creepy, you know, wax works, right. You know, that kind of that trope, but yeah, there were, you, you didn't like the kind of the under undertone of that story, particularly yeah. so Eleanor Snips, um, Smith is probably uh, one of the ones that kind of comes to my mind. And there was also a, a much earlier writer from um, so the George Edgerton period, and I've forgotten her name. It was the story about the Italian girl. Vernon Lee. Vernon Lee. Oh. I really would have been very pleased to have a Vernon Lee story, but we could not find one that we agreed on. Yeah, and that just kind of came down to style too. I don't think you weren't as, you know, as big of a fan of style, but you did like um, Dianea. Uh, which if you've read that um and you know vernon lee just her her stories are amazing but i could see you know again and they were they're quite long so that's you know we talked that about you know one. copyright yeah. and other things and you mentioned that with eleanor morden um we had to balance that out and some you know you think okay i have a you know a novella here taking the place of five short stories you know that so we could get five authors and we could get one author so we did have that that brings up a good point about space and you know yeah. representing within that space as well but yeah Vernon Lee was another we kind of we went yeah. back and forth because it's important for us that we can post a book and still get it through the letterbox that is for large letter postage in the UK because if it's bigger than that it costs me twice the price to post it and there goes our profit margin so I know the thickness of the book, I know the page count, I know the word count, and that's what restricts us as well as paying for the actual story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's some, um, I, I really like, um, it's, it's a pretty rare collection, um, Naomi Royd Smith uh, oh, did God. a collection. And I don't think I even, I don't think I even sent you one because again, there's issues of copyright and you know, it gets, yeah. it gets pretty expensive you know, to have to, to pay for licensing and things like that. But um, yeah, I'm, I have a, probably a really, you know, if I sit down and think of it, I have a long list of, of ones that I would like to. I'm, I'm really happy with the ones that we got in the two volumes though. And I'm really happy we're doing the single author ones now as well. Yeah, it's, it's a different process. Cleo has another question. Has your experience in researching women's weird fiction from a century ago changed or informed the way you interact with current women's weird? That's it. I don't really emerge much from the, <laughs> the time period that I research. So I'd like to actually read more. Um, yeah, I'm so I'm, you know, I don't much go beyond World War Two. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I wish I'd like to, you know, maybe have time to read more of the current because I know that there, um, you know, I know that there are women now involved in the, you know, new weird. Um, and Amy, you might do you know, because I mean, do you know of any that I wish I knew more about that area. Yeah. There's, um, I think actually you're part of a movement here that's mm -hmm. that's getting a kind of critical mass in terms of looking at the tradition, both the history and the, and the current day. Um, I've been really pleased to see, for example, uh, Valancourt Books bringing out their Monster She Wrote series, which is based on the Monster She Wrote uh, book that came out, um, I guess, two years ago, uh, looking at how the the horror and speculative fiction tradition by women has moved from the historical to the current day. And they're bringing back works that were published mostly in the 20th century, starting with uh, earlier works like uh, they have a collection of uh, women of weird tales that's bringing together uh, stories that were during the pulp era, but then moving on into the 70s and 80s, um, authors, uh, Elizabeth Ingstrom, for example, some of her earlier works that are out of print, um, and, uh, and uh, Tuttle, um, Lisa Tuttle, uh, some of those authors who are very much in conversation with the women who were writing before them, uh, very knowledgeable. Uh, and so their work is, is most definitely influenced by the tradition. And so I, I think it's, it's really interesting that this particular era that you're working in 
is you're, you're bringing this to scholarly attention and the attention of, of uh, professors and teachers and, and you know this will get into the classroom and this will be available to interested readers because there's also sort of a parallel event bringing in the you know intellectual and literary uh, daughters and granddaughters and great granddaughters right now um, mm -hmm. of these authors in that critical pulp era and the sort of paperback era of the 70s and 80s uh, that also ha have been kind of lost uh, for, for a variety of reasons because of the way that was uh, you know publishing and in, in, for example the paperbacks of the 70s and 80s mm -hmm. were very much a, a, a fly by night and, and intentionally um, uh, disposable kind of medium. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so I think, I think there are authors uh, today, but also authors who are sort of the, the parent figures of those who are writing today, mm -hmm. who are getting uh, a, another, another life. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and that's I one of the reasons why I don't, I don't really go much past, I mean, not intentionally, but I don't go much past, you know, 1950, because I keep finding so many authors that need reintroducing, you know, from the previous decades. And, yeah. you know, I was, I was trained as a, as a Victorian scholar. And, you know, that's sort of where I got my start. And then just like every year, I just keep moving more and more into the 20th century. And, you know, in the 20s and 30s there's all these amazing women you know like you said writing's really getting into this tradition and helping to establish it mm -hmm. um so so yeah there's just so <laughs> there's so much more to to be found just within you know 18 1890 to 1940 you know yeah well i think that is a good place to stop so i'm going to start the stop the recording now